special to Jaguar seminar in honor of Graham Wolden, who visited us for years from Glasgow. We usually have it on Tuesday afternoons, but in summer we usually have a recess, but I thought it was very appropriate to ask you to give a talk while you're visiting us. He's here for a month on the Michael Visitors Program. It's been a very productive time, I think, and it's a good first visit. It's been good. Welcome. Uh, also, it's Peter's our new chair, so this is like my swan, swan song in terms of introducing speakers, and Peter, you'll be taking over the next week. Thank you. Well, as I said, it's a pleasure to have Graham visit us. Uh, his PhD is Cavendish Laboratory in Radio Astronomy, and he told me that he was looking, he started his life with upper limits because he didn't see what he was looking for, which was uh, a pulse on the Cass A at the time. Continued at Cavendish as a postdoc mm -hmm. in CMBR work. Mm -hmm. And then now you're on the faculty at the University of Glasgow. And I met you first, I guess, five years ago when you were dipping your toe into gravitational wave astronomy, checking out uh, at a at a geo meeting in Cardiff what it was all about. That's right. And uh, lo and behold, it's blossomed into basically your full-time commitment now. Pretty much. So let's welcome Graham. He's going to tell us about Bayesian analysis. <coughs> Lisa. Oh, but thanks very much. What did I shut the door? Are we? Are we okay. Right? okay. You start right. speaking. Well, it's a real pleasure to um, um, entertain you this afternoon with this. Um, um, what I'm talking about is uh, the talk really split into half. Um, there's um, uh, an introduction, um, which is part one, which is really just a, a quick overview of why I think the, the Hazian techniques are the right way to approach the um, issue of identifying sources in the, uh, in the time series from Lisa. And that will occupy around about half the talk. And the second half is actually applying these to uh, a toy problem, a simplified problem, um, which, is, which is appropriate um, and which um, brings out quite a few of the issues which uh, um, this particular approach is able to tackle. Um, so let's, let's start with uh, the first part, which is really just to do with um, making quite sure we understand what we're talking about. And uh, this, for some of you, may be uh, quite straightforward, and you've heard it before. Uh, for that, I apologize. But I think it's important because it's very uh, we're relevant to what we do, and um, it's very relevant to how you interpret what the results are. Um, so this is how we start. Why, why do we want to use uh, Hazian techniques to do our analysis. Well, here's a rather a, a, a phenomenal quotation from uh, Jerzy uh, Neumann, who, who we all know as, uh, as one of the founders of frequentist hypothesis testing. And it just highlights the fact that orthodox statistics, which is what we usually use for our analyses, aren't terribly well constructed for astronomy. And I'll read it out because it's so important. It says, the trouble is that what we statisticians call Hodden statistics, which is orthodox statistics, was developed under strong pressure on the part of biologists. And as a result, there is practically nothing done uh, us, which is directly applicable to the problems of astronomy. Now that's a scary quote because this is essentially the equipment we use at the moment for a large fraction of our, um, of our analysis. Sorry? When was this board made? I don't know. I don't know. I'm afraid. Uh, I, would, I would imagine in the 60s, but I don't know. Okay, so what do, we, what do we mean when we talk about, about, about the Bayesian approach to things? Well, uh, the, 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 the Bayesian technique is really just the algebra of inductive reasoning. So if you know what inductive reasoning is, there's no problem. There's, there is only a single algebra, which is good. Uh, so in, in principle, there's only one way to do everything, which is, 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 is also rather good. And within this framework, we think of probability. The word probability is used to indicate a measure of our state of knowledge or a degree of belief in a statement, in a, in a hypothesis, in the value of a variable, in anything really. So probability here isn't uh, the um, relative frequency in repeated outcomes. It's actually a, a number between 0 and 1, which represents our degree of belief in a statement. So you can think of it as an extension of, 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 of ordinary, <laughs> ordinary Polian logic, where you have a 0 to represent uh, something being false and a 1 to represent it true. Um, in inductive reasoning, you have other numbers between those which represent your state of, of no, knowledge. You shouldn't get it confused with quasi logic. That's a different thing, uh, which actually isn't a probabilistic framework in a sense. It's not able to obey some of the important constraints of, uh, of, of what makes up a probabilistic statement. 
OK, so here we are, just to make it absolutely clear, if we think about deductive reasoning, which is what we normally think about, um, here's a couple of statements, um, one of which is deduced from the other. So if you're told that all pulsars are neutron stars and our target object is a pulsar, you can deduce from that information that our target is a neutron star. It's a, it's a hard deduction. It's absolutely true if what's written up here um, is also true. So that's a deductive reasoning. But indeductive reasoning is, is the other way around here. So when your information isn't quite supplied like that. So if you're supplied with uh, the same information at the start, all, all pulsars and neutron stars, but you're told that our target is a neutron star, Obviously, you can't deduce it's therefore a pulsar, but you may infer it's more probable it's a pulsar. And how much more probable will, of course, depend on what else it could be. Um, and uh, the algebra of, of, of Hayesian reasoning is really just the way in which you can, uh, in a quantitative way, work out how more probable it is that your um, target is a pulsar. OK, well, um, so generally, we talk about um, a joint um, uh, parameter and hypothesis case um, in which we uh, quantify our information. And we talk about the probability of all our observations and all our hypotheses when you're, that's this vertical uh, uh, divider here just means when you're, when you're in heaven, everything after it, which is some general world view. And this probability is, as I say, is a, a scalar quantity between 0 and 1, but it's high dimensional because um, everything here on the left-hand side is, is, a, is, is either an observable or is a variable in your hypothesis. And it turns out rather remarkably there's actually only a single algebra which you can construct which um, uh, describes the rules of manipulating uh, these sorts of inferential structures. And one of which is just the familiar uh, rule of the product rule in, in statistics, which is that the uh, probability of, uh, of uh, uh, the joint probability of a, a pair of items, here we've got the data and a hypothesis, when you're um, under some worldview, is just equal to, well, you can split them up in this way, or you can split them up in this way. We probably already know this. And straight from this, um, this inevitable rule, which uh, comes out of trying to quantify joint uncertainty um, in this way, is, uh, is, is uh, a rather uh, important equation for what we're trying to do, which is, is Hayes' theorem, which is essentially the equation which tells us how to improve our, um, uh, our, our understanding of a problem when we introduce some fresh observations. Um, Hayes' theorem really is just uh, what's written here, and I've now turn the variables into something a bit more appropriate for uh, an analysis problem. So we, we talk, and there's a, there's a large amount of vocabulary in all of this, which is a bit annoying, um, uh, but it's important to understand what the words mean. We talk about the posterior probability. This is the probability of your huddle after you've observed uh, whatever you've observed, and within some general worldview, I. I is often the symbol for the general worldview. And what, what that is, is what you knew prior to your observations of the data, which is this, um, times a likelihood, which is the probability of observing what you observed if your, if your particular huddle were true, divided by a quantity which is essentially that numerator integrated over all, uh, all huddles, which uh, are, are consistent uh, with I. And that's often called the evidence or the global likelihood. Now, if you're just interested in working out the parameters of, of, of a huddle, then because that's independent of it, often you can ignore this. Uh, but there are certain circumstances where that evidence is actually rather important. Right. So, um, yeah. So the important thing is that pretty much everything there, certainly uh, that bit there, and almost always that bit, and frequently that bit, you can uh, calculate in an absolute way, and therefore you can work out this posterior probability. And of course, this posterior probability for your, your huddle can be used as a prior in some observations in the future. Right, so just to whip through some other important things, um, we talk about the marginal probabilities. Marginal probabilities are just essentially um, uh, the situation where you remove any dependency on a parameter you're not interested in. So if, for example, you have a pair of, of, um, of well, in this case, we're talking about a pair of 
propositions x and y, um, x being drawn from some set and y from another set, then the probability of x alone is just actually equal to the joint probability at, um, when you add up over the um, um, over all the y's. In other words, you sort of integrate out the, the parameter which you're not interested in. And these parameters which you're not interested in are usually referred to as nuisance parameters uh, for obvious reasons. And of course, this smoothly extends uh, to integral forms. Uh, so if you have a joint probability uh, for a pair of parameters x and y, and in fact you're just interested in x, um, you can integrate over y and, and, um, and all as well. It's very important. That's not um, anything at all contentious. In fact, there isn't anything I've said up till now which is at all contentious because this is, this is just algebra. There isn't really anything here which, uh, which um, anyone would argue with, I don't think. Okay, so let's have a look at an example of how this works in practice. So this is just um, a single example. Um, um, and after this, we'll actually head on to the LISA problem um, and explain how these techniques can be applied for LISA. So let's think about a very simple uh, parameter estimation problem. And uh, this is a zeroth order astronomical example because the astronomy in it isn't very good. But imagine a situation in which um, uh, GRBs are all equally luminous objects and are distributed homogeneously in the universe. So you've got these standard candles uh, throughout the universe. And let's imagine we observe one GRB and we see three uh, photons from it in a period of a second. Just three photons. And our job is to estimate the flux of the source, F. And there's an obvious answer. The flux is three per second. So the flux is about three. And that's the seat of the pants answer. F is equal to three photons per second. But of course, we understand uncertainties. And we'd say, well, this is a, these are, these are hot on events. And therefore, there's an uncertainty of about square root of three in that. And that's a perfectly respectable answer. But of course, you're throwing away um, a large fraction of the information which you were supplied with in the question here. You're throwing away the fact these events are equally luminous. And you're throwing away the fact that they're distributed homoge um, homogeneously. So what happens if we include this uh, background information in our analysis? Well, the, the types of correction you introduce are very similar to uh, the corrections one would classically introduce um, uh, to correct for a, a Holmquist bias in, uh, in, in, in population surveys. But let's have a look how it works in, in, in a Bayesian frame. So, so if, our, if our sources are homogeneous, we can say, of course, that the probability that they're at a particular radius r from us is just proportional to uh, r squared, uh, like that. And then, because we know they're equally luminous, we can, we can change the variable because we have a straight relationship between r and f, the flux. And so um, uh, we can write down um, the, um, the probability of, of, um, of a particular flux, f, prior to any observations at all. And that probability is just equal to the probability of r, which um, uh, is uh, essentially uh, proportional to r squared times uh, dr, d, dr df. And that ends up proportional to f to the minus 5 halves. So this is our prior probability on f. It's the sort of the um, uncertainty in f which we would expect without any observations. It's just holding the information that these are equally luminous sources isotropically, isotropically distributed. And how do we interpret this? Well, it just means that there are many more low flux sources than there are high flux sources because they're all a long way away, very obvious. OK, so that's our prior for f. And now we apply our equation to combine this prior with a likelihood. And the likelihood is the probability of observing n photons for a particular um, flux f. So if you're told f, what's the probability of observing n? And if you times these together, you end up with your posterior for f. OK, what's the likelihood then for observing n Photons. Well, of course, that's just a Poisson, uh, Poisson distribution, which looks like this. So we can just write that down, that we know. So if we multiply that by our prior, we end up finally for our posterior probability for f. So this is the posterior probability for the flux of the source when you're told you observe n photons. Um, and it's this. It's a, it's a curve. It's not a single number. It's, it's not an interval. It's a curve. Uh, a posterior curve, which looks like this. This is f here on the x-axis. Here's 3. So this, this represents um, our seat of the pants answer. And as you can see, 3 is out some way in the wings of the, uh, 
of, of the, the distribution of the probability. The majority of the, of the probability is round about here. In fact, the most probable, f, if it's a bit skewed, but I suppose most probable means, uh, means most probable, always. Um, most probable is actually equal to half, of, half a photon per second, much, much smaller than 3. So how, how does that make sense? Well, it makes sense because, uh, because of the distribution of the sources. It's, in fact, for these small statistics, small number of statistics, it's more probable that this is a, a, a source a long way away, which has just undergone a fluctuation, and you've seen three photons, than um, it is that it's a, a, a source which is reasonably close and which has um, emitted its expected number of, number of photons, which is completely reasonable. Um, in some regime as well. But you'd hope at least that when n was large, you'd end up in the situation where your seat of the pants answer was uh, closer to the truth. And in fact, uh, that is the case. When n is large, then um, um, uh, it, it will in fact uh, converge to, to n over t. OK, so that's the sort of, um, of argument which one would apply if one was trying to do parameter estimation. Now, um, the other important application of, of uh, Bayesian statistics is in um, hypothesis testing. And that's, Brian, hi. Can I ask you to go back? Yeah, sure. Does, does the Bayesian flux, does the probability of the Bayesian flux allow for negative flux? Or is that no. just, uh, what's that last parenthetic expression? Uh, where's that? The most probable value of f. The most probable value of f is n minus 5 halves. OK. Um, so if you ma maximize this, yeah. that's at n minus for five halves. So if n is extremely large, then that heads so that towards n. One. n can be one or two, right? Um, um, true. The n can be one or two. So under those circumstances, um, uh, what Did would happen then? Do you have a prior that said that the flux can't be negative? Or? Um, I, don't, I, I think it probably breaks down then. No, uh, we, we haven't got a prior when it's, uh, that's, that's a good question. I think we haven't got a prior here which explicitly excludes um, um, well, we do. Yeah, we do actually. Yeah, yeah. It's all all these things. If if there's any chance at all of you having a a flux of of zero, then having a prior which explodes at the origin is is always a bad thing. And a long ring. Um, uh, so and all the circumstances, if you end up with a result like this, you you might replace it with a with a prior which actually turns over. And we'll have an, an example of that in a okay. in a. Um, in a later, uh, well, in the actually in the uh, application to l to laser data. Um, okay, very good. So, in terms of hypothesis testing, in a frequentist framework, um, um, hypothesis testing is an entirely separate area. Um, but in a Bayesian framework, it's actually exactly the same. You just uh, just scramble the symbols within your um, algebra. The only uh, problem in terms of hypothesis. Testing is that unlike when you have a variable whose range is well defined, the range of of uh, hypotheses which compete um, to um, hold the mantle of what's true uh, is is often um, uncountable and and hard to identify. Um, and so, generally, when one thinks in hypothesis, in terms of hypothesis tests, one thinks in terms of odds ratios. So one just compares a pair of hy hypotheses, and that's just the relative posterior probability of hypothesis H1 and H2 when you're told some observations. And again, you can split these up uh, y using the product rule in terms of a pair of terms. This term here are the, are the prior odds. That's the relative odds of the hypotheses prior to your observations. And then there's this factor here, which is the ratio of the evidences. If you remember what evidence was, it was the, the, uh, the, um, the denominator in the expression we used when we were trying, trying to work out a parameter uh, which uh, was determined under each of these hypotheses. And this uh, ratio is called the height factor. And it's, the, it's often the quantity in which you work because that one there uh, is just a multiplicative factor. Um, and one can um, argue about that forever, often. Right, so the prior odds, uh, we won't talk about that much, but the, the but the Bayes factors here are essentially just the integral of the um, of the la la of the la likelihood of the data when you're told your hypothesis and perhaps a, a parameter or a number of parameters of the model integrated over the values of the parameter. So in some ways, it's kind of like the global likelihood. It's the it's what's the likelihood of the high 
hypothesis for any set of parameters at all which um, it's able to hold. Um, now, this is a very important expression uh, for what we're going to be having a look at in a few minutes because um, what it is is essentially the integral, integral of the product of a likelihood, and here's the likelihood, times a prior. And this likelihood is the likelihood of some parameter a within your hypothesis h. And uh, we're integrating over a. We're asking ourselves, how likely is it that this hypothesis is true for any value of your parameter at all? So here's the likelihood uh, for a, which has a position here, L max. Um, um, and it's uh, centered around um, some particular place. And, um, and it has a range here, which is the width of the likelihood, which essentially depends on how, how um, accurate your observations are. And here's the prior, which is, um, again, uh, dependent on h, because it is the prior for h, but it's usually wider than the likelihood, because, of course, your observation is there to increase your state of understanding of what a is, and therefore, or, or, or h is, and therefore, you'd expect it to be wider. So when you multiply these together, what you end up with is um, 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 an integral which can be approximated as equal to uh, the area under this, which is about the width times the height, times the height of the prior. And this is a probability in A, so therefore its height is equal to about 1 over its range. So this whole integral is round about the maximum likelihood here times the ratio of the likelihood range over the prior range, this width over this width. And that's, that's uh, called the Occam factor in analyses like these uh, from Occam's razor. And it's the Occam factor because it's a, it's a numerical factor which will penalize a um, penalize a hodl which has a high uh, maximum likelihood if its prior is much, much wider than the, than the likelihood. In other words, if your prior is very, very flexible, has perhaps a large number of degrees of freedom, or has a range of parameter values which are, which are extremely wide, then that hodl um, will um, be penalized because it's over-flexible. So that's why it's regarded as the Occam factor in these analyses. It's a quantitative way. The trials factor. If you're doing an experiment and you say, okay, I'm willing to look, looking back to this bar experiment for a moment, mm -hmm. they saw a significant peak, but they didn't a priori say it is. that it is important. Yeah. That value of sidereal time, yes. they were willing to accept a peak anywhere. It, it's connected with that. So it's connected with the range of high high hypotheses which you're prepared to entertain um, a priori. And then if you just select out one of those afterwards, right. then you shouldn't be surprised. There should be a large extra factor here which, which uh, says, hey, you're, this isn't fair. And this emerges automatically. It's not like we've had to add this in. Uh, this is a, is a natural um, um, result of, of um, arguing in this way. So Occam factors will penalize any hodl which includes wasted parameter space, even if the maximum likelihood fits is extremely good. And that's what we want, of course. That's a, that's a very attractive a very attractive thing. It's a particularly attractive thing for the Lisa problem. And that's why uh, the Lisa confusion problem, I should say. And that's why um, um, uh, we've applied these techniques uh, to exactly that problem. So this is Occam's razor, if, if you can't remember what Occam's razor was. Um, um, I, when I was a kid, I heard of Occam's razor, and I was never quite sure what it meant by simple, because some things, some people are very simple, and to other people are dreadfully complicated. Um, and this has now resolved itself in my mind because I now understand what it means when you say a thing is, 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 is simple. It just means that it has a small Occam factor. Um, so that's good. So I'm happy now. OK, so that's the end of the introduction. Um, and um, and um, what I've been talking about up till now has been pretty standard stuff. Um, and uh, there are quite a few excellent texts which are available now, uh, which explain it all much more effectively than I have, I'm sure. Um, what we're going to go on to is applying uh, these ideas to the issues of data analysis in LISA, and particularly, in the first instance anyway, thinking about the confusion problem. I'm not going to say too much about LISA, um, only this slide, really, just to highlight the fact that uh, here's the, here's the uh, sensitivity curve of uh, whole ESA, and we are aware that at some level, anyway, although it's rather uncertain as to how much it's important, but at some level, there is confusion noise at low frequency. That is, there are a large number of white dwarf, white dwarf binaries, which are so large in number and so close together in frequency 
that in, in classical terms of the separation in frequency as, uh, um, in, uh, as related to the reciprocal of the observing time, they're actually closer together than the reciprocal of the observing time. So therefore, they are classically confused in frequency. Um, and of course, therefore, we have a problem about, pat particularly in the area where um, this is be beginning to be a serious problem, and that you need to be able to sort out the noise from the signal. You need to be able to allocate um, um, some probability to this power being from noise and this power being from signal. And so what we're going to do is to tackle a confused problem, uh, a simplified uh, confused problem, in which we identify the signals and the noise at the same time. So let's go. Oh, no, let's not go. Let's, <laughs> let's have a look at things which are not generally true. This is an extra slide I added in. Um, these are, these are some phrases I've, I've, I've heard around um, um, over time. So I thought I'd have a slide uh, just to say that these are things which are not generally true. And the first one, which isn't generally true, is that if you have a time series of length t, then its frequency resolution is 1 over t. OK? Now, that's, that's not true. That's absolutely not true. That's the width of a fast Fourier transform channel. Uh, but the frequency resolution. Um, of, of any analysis is really just how accurately can you determine a frequency. And of course, that depends on your signal to noise ratio. It depends on how strong, strong the signal is. It's exactly the same issue about asking the question, how accurately can you determine the position of a star on the sky um, with arc second seeing? Well, if you observe for long enough, you can determine it to a very small fraction of an arc second. In much the same way, you can determine the frequency of a, of a signal to much uh, higher resolution than 1 over t if you observe uh, uh, with a high enough SNR ratio. And, that, and the obvious example is the millisecond, is the, the binary pulsar uh, 1913 plus 16, which we now know to a frequency of um, about 10 to the minus 13 of a hertz. But of course, we haven't been observing it for 300,000 years. That we know. OK, so that's the first thing which is not generally true. Second thing which is not generally true is that, um, and I think most people would now, would now would now agree with this, and that is you cannot subtract sources one by one from a time series and hope to end up with um, um, some independent form of random noise at the end and, and without those individual subtractions in interfering with each other. Um, of course, that can only be done if the sources are orthogonal over the observing run. It's not even, um, it's, it's, a, it's a rather a precise requirement, and that is very, very rarely true. So any technique which only consists of subtracting uh, sources one by one uh, will, will inevitably fail in the long run at some level. And the third thing which is not generally true is that the frequency confusion sets a fundamental uh, resolution limit for low-frequency LISA. Um, what, of course, sets the fundamental confusion limit for low-frequency LISA is parameter confusion. And frequency is one parameter out of other parameters. Um, and so, for example, if we include the location of the source on the sky, then that will um, help to resolve confusing problems in frequency. And of course, if you have signals which are uh, sufficiently strong, then again, you can improve your uh, resolution, your confusion resolution. Right, so let's, let's head on to our real uh, problem now. Uh, this is our toy zeroth order LISA problem. And it really just consists of analyzing uh, uh, a, a superposition of sinusoids, random sinusoids, in a time series. Uh, very simple, pretty much as simple as we can make it. So this is a time series of 1,000 samples in time. And it contains an unknown number of sinusoids of unknown amplitude, and frequency, and phase. And they are superposed on Gaussian noise of unknown variance. So you're just defined with this time series. And your job as an analyst is to determine the number of sinusoids there, their amplitudes, their phases, and their frequencies, and also the uh, variance of the noise all at once. Now, there's a number of ways of having a look at this. But the way we chose to do it was actually to include the number of signals um, as a parameter in a global, global model. So in other words, um, as well as having the obvious parameters, which are things like frequencies and amplitudes and, and, and hazes and so on, we also included m, the number of sinusoids, as a parameter in the model. Uh, it's an integer parameter, of course, uh, but we determine it uh, in a way which is similar to the example uh, 
um, on the GRBs rather than the example on high hypothesis comparison. Now that's all right because the Occam factor remains in there. There's no um, um, removal of the Occam factor. That's, 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 um, that hangs on in. So let's have a look how this works in practice. Um, um, so we in fact choose to describe our signal like this. So it's a superposition of M sinusoids. Uh, we've, we've decided to, to, to use a, a sine and a cosine with amplitudes um, A and A here as our, as our components rather than an amplitude and a phase. Um, um, and they have random, f random frequencies F um, and uh, there are M of them. And those, si those M signals are parameterized with a vector AM which is just the list of parameter triples for each of the sources, A and B and F, M of those, and then there's the variance of the noise uh, for M. The reason why there's an M there is that if you change the number of signals which you determined, you'd also change some inference about, about the noise, because you're obviously having to determine all these things together. OK, so there's our signal. Those are the parameters. Uh, here are our, our observations, our thousand observations. It's, a, it's uh, those signals in white noise. And right away, there's only one way to answer these sorts of problems within a Bayesian framework. You write down the likelihood. It's the start. It's the likelihood of your, your, uh, your parameters, which are AM, this, um, this vector, and M, the number of components. Um, um, and it's the probability of, of the data which you observe when you're told M and AM. And it's just equal to this. It's a joint um, multivariate Gaussian likelihood um, in, in a pretty simple form. OK, so that's the likelihood. Um, of course, uh, we need to get some priors. So let's imagine we can choose some sensible priors on M and on AM. Um, and if we have those, if we have those priors, and here it is, we just times that with the likelihood, and we end up with a posterior, posterior probability for M, number of components, and AM, the uh, parameter triples uh, for each of those sinusoidal components. Okay, so this is a, uh, that's all we've got to do. That's the entire problem. That's the entire answer. I mean, I could, I, I could almost end right now. The only problem is, of course, that this is a 3M plus 2 um, dimensional posterior space. Um, and M is around about 100, as it turns out, in our problem. Um, so this is a rather a large thing, uh, rather unwieldy. Um, and of course, in the real world, in, in the real, um, real laser problem, M may be uh, 50, 100,000, in which case it's a significant problem. And so really, what we want to do is to, instead of working in this high dimensional space, is to project this space, is to marginalize this space onto the quantities of interest. Now, what we might be interested in is just the number of sources which are there, m. We might not be interested in what their amplitudes are or their frequencies. We just want to know how many are there. Or we may just be interested in the noise. We may not be interested in, in any of the astronomy at all. We may be interested in the instrument. Um, so to extract information on these, on these, the marginalize, over all the other parameters, all the other um, high dimensional parameters here. And this means we need to do um, um, high dimensional integrals. And generally, they're not analytic, although for this particular problem, uh, with some minor simplifications, they actually are. But we haven't analyzed this toy problem in, in an analytic way. So one way to do this, and it is only one way, is, is to use um, a Markov chain Monte Carlo technique, which is becoming rather popular uh, to do precisely this job for reasons which I will explain now. Um, uh, so just to say that this is work which uh, has recently been published in FISREV D, and the chap who's performed the majority of it, of it is Richard Umstatter, who's a research student um, in, in the University of, um, of uh, Auckland in the statistics department there. He's working very uh, closely um, uh, uh, with us on this. OK, so uh, just to say a few things about how Markov chain Monte Carlo works, um, because it's rather clever and it's well worth understanding. Um, the general problem is we need to work out integrals of this form. We need to work out marginal integrals, which are integrals over the, over the, uh, the parameters of a high dimensional joint posterior probability here, um, over all of them except a few. Here, we've just left one x. And, um, the way in which this is approached in, in MCMC is that you sample 
the uh, parameter space, or high dimensional parameter space, you sample it in a random way, or at least in a quasi random way, such that the density of samples reflects um, the posterior probability at that posi particular position in the high dimensional uh, probability uh, in, in the high dimensional case. So, what you'd expect would be um, samples all over the space, but they would heap up at regions where the probability was high, and they'd be rather sparse at regions where the probability was low. Um, and if you have that, it's rather, it's rather straightforward to determine what these integrals are from the uh, um, histograms of the components of the samples. So um, these MCMC algorithms, they perform random walks uh, um, uh, um, in parameter space um, uh, in this way, so that the probability that they're in some particular hypervolume is just proportional uh, to the probability of that hypervolume. In some absolute sense. OK, so. Um, this is a random walk in the sense that the next step depends on your previous step. So this is, this is sufficient to make it into, um, uh, into a Harkov chain. There are correlations between the steps. Um, the remarkable thing about it is that these correlations are actually irrelevant. Um, you can forget about them. Um, and um, so long as you've reached equilibrium, the um, analysis is very similar and is highly analogous to um, uh, s uh, uh, the um, equilibrium populations of a couple of uh, uh, quantum states in, in uh, thermal equilibrium. Um, so in other words, the transition probabilities are such that um, uh, so long as you're in equilibrium, the way in which you make the, tra make the transitions um, isn't terribly important. Right, so in practice, how does it work? So th this slide is really just the entire um, um, algorithm for a simple MCMC uh, procedure. It's incredibly simple. Um, um, has existed, of course, for a long time. Only been applied to probability problems like this relatively recently. Um, how does it work? Well, imagine that you're in some some location here. A A T subscript here just represents the time because you think of these um, uh, samples as occurring sequentially in time. Um, AT, and when you're there, you want to move to some new place, which we're going to call AT primed, and you decide where to move to with some proposal, uh, proposal distribution, which we will generally call uh, call uh, call a proposal distribution of Q um, of AT primed when you're told AT. Now, this can be very simple indeed. It can be actually almost anything, as it it turns out what you choose here really just determines the speed at which the exploration happens. This could be just a, a Gaussian uh, centered on your previous, uh, your previous step. And the size of the step is, uh, will occur with a probability which depends on the width of the Gaussian. OK, so you choose some candidates step here with some uh, probability which depends on this proposal <laughs> proposal distribution. You then work out a thing called the metropolis ratio, which is, well, if this is a, if this is, is a symmetrical uh, distribution, in other words, if a hop in the other direction would be equally probable, then this term and this term are the same. They just drop out. So the metropolis ratio is just essentially the probability of, of, of where you jump to over the probability of where you are. It's just the, the value of the integrand, if you like at each of those locations. And if you always um, improve uh, the probability, if, if, uh, if, if r is greater than 1, then you always make the step. Okay? You always head uphill in that sense. But if r is less than 1, you make the step only with probability r. Okay? Um, so in other words, if you've produced a proposal here which is extremely outlandish, then it might happen, uh, but with a rather a low probability. Very importantly, if you decide you're not, you're not the step, you repeat the present step as the next step. And with this metropolis ratio and, and this uh, extra factor here, that's sufficient to uh, ensure that um, the um, equilibrium distribution of your samples is indeed the uh, probability distribution which you're trying to explore.
So, so the form of this is rather important. And often this is written, this, this whole exercise is written out in this way. You, to talk, you talk about an acceptance probability, which is the minimum of one or, the, or, this, or this ratio. Graham, does the sentence you want to explore here you don't know P of A? Uh, you, you, uh, you have an expression for, for P of A, uh, uh, but it's rather slow to evaluate, so you can't integrate it over, um, over the whole of the space. I was just wondering so, how, you, how you evaluate it twice in the R. Yeah, we have to be able to evaluate it, because that's what actually holds all the information. That's what holds the observations, this stuff. It's the, it's, it's, uh, that's just the likelihood, um, likelihood times a prior. Um, so that it can be worked out, but it's a bit slow to work it out. And of course, this iterates around, and you end up with um, um, a histogram of, um, of results. Um, so this, this sequence of steps, A of T, is a Markov train, which is drawn from um, this uh, high dimensional probability, probability distribution which you have. And therefore, if you histogram up any of the components of uh, these uh, these parameters from your entire run, your entire um, MCMC run, you'll end up with a curve which approximates um, the probability, the marginal probability distribution of those particular parameters. And how this works is rather clever, but it's it's, it's essentially the form of the acceptance probability, which uh, which guarantees the reversibility of the jumps and therefore allows you to uh, reach the correct equilibrium equilibrium. Distribution. Of course, you can. Uh, you're able to 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 begin far out from equilibrium, and therefore there's a, a period at the start where you have to allow the chain to converge onto the true uh, equilibrium uh, equilibrium distribution. Okay, so th this is what real chains look like. Um, these are chains which are for a number of of simultaneous sources, very similar to the problem we have tackled here. And as you can see at the start, there are various events where they try to settle out, but eventually they home in on a value and they just sit there and hop around. And the, um, and the histogram of, of the values which they explore here is the um, uh, probability distribution of that particular parameter. These are, of course, correlated in general. So if you want to work out the joint probability, you just have to join, have to work out the joint histogram of the, the a pair of parameters. The M yes. Um, this actually was from a slightly different problem, but it's, um, in essence, there from the components within an M. Um, so this might represent M equals however, however many how many components are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That might equal M equals nine. Okay, uh, so I'll just uh, uh, very quickly whip through how uh, the algorithm needs to be changed to um, apply to the Lisa problem. You need to change the acceptance probabilities um, slightly if you're going to jump between a dimension, because of course if you add in extra uh, an extra dimension, then you greatly widen the parameter space. Uh, so there's a Jacobian here which is, is added on, um, and that ensures reversibility um, and means that our transform uh, between um, um, our, 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 our dates um, when we change the number of sources, transdimensional um, hops where M changes, are, are reversible. And so a reversible, um, reversible jump routine like this is required in order to um, um, explore the number of sinus orbits which may be present. And of course when you make a trans-dimensional move you have to find some procedure for inventing or, or, or removing um, a signal. And so we think about split and merge where you have a sinusoid, you split it in half and you um, have a look at the at the result of that, or a merge where you take a pair of sinusoids and you and you merge them together, and you have a look how probable that looks. And of course, you can just uh, you can annihilate them and you can you can <laughs> create them as well. And uh, just working through it. So, for example, if you wanted a split transition, then what you would want to do is to take your original a and your k and your f for one for one signal, and then uh, split it in half, so half the amplitude. Um, um, of it and hold on to the same frequency but then add random numbers onto all of those. Uh, so if you began with something like this it would split to something like that. 
which would have a small separation around uh, the original, original, original frequency and whose amplitudes would add up to something like the original amplitude. And of course, a transition of that sort would happen with a probability which depends on the split, depends on, the, on this uh, random vector r here, which, uh, which we added on uh, uh, to the end of it. So that's a split transition. A merge is just the same thing the other way around. You just, you take a pair of, randomly, you take a pair of sinusoids within your current step and you see what happens if you try to, try to merge them together. These are just tricks. These are engineering tricks for exploring the space. They're not terribly profound. Uh, they're just a way to um, achieve the job. And, and these things are under uh, constant improvement. There are lots of handles to turn on them. You can, you can make them run more efficiently or less, as it turns out. Okay, so that's one important thing. The other important thing we've had to do is something called um, the delayed rejection technique, and that is to improve the mixing of the, of the procedure. Uh, instead of rejecting a, s a sample immediately, if, uh, if, um, uh, if um, we uh, dis dis decide its metropolis ratio is a bit low, instead of rejecting it right away, we actually make a, a separate step. Again, we make a second step and only reject those pair of steps if uh, the second step is also rejected. And this is rather important. It improves the mixing. And um, I won't go through this because we're beginning to run out of time. But essentially, what you end up with is um, a, a, a global Markov chain Monte Carlo technique, which is, has a wonderful uh, acronym of, uh, well, this, which I won't even try to say. But it's uh, uh, a delayed rejection rever reversible jump knockoff chain Monte Carlo method. Do I detect that this goes against the nine report because you're going back into biology here, right? Um, this is actually a statistics journal, so it's, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you could be right. Okay, um, so that's the, that's the engine, if you like, which explores the space. You have to begin somewhere, and the obvious place to begin is just to take an FFT of the data and slice it at some level and, and um, count how many signals there are or how many, how many maxima there are over your slice and use those maxima as a starting position for your MCMC chain. Uh, we set the threshold relatively low because it's actually easier to destroy um, a signal which is rather poor than it is to create a signal which is rather good. Um, uh, so in other words, we begin with a threshold which is relatively low uh, on this. And um, the simulations we've run are pretty much what I've already said. Uh, there were actually 100 sinusoids in the, in the, in the simulation. Um, um, and the uh, amplitudes were chosen randomly within the, this range. And the frequencies were chosen randomly within this range. And the noise actually had a sigma of 1. In our reconstruction, uh, we had, uh, these are all extremely uncontentious, um, we had um, uh, amplitudes with priors which were uniform again over um, this time minus five to five, just to make them sufficiently wide. We used um, a frequency prior which was uniform up to the uh, Nyquist frequency. And we had a sigma which actually had what looks like a, a one over sigma squared prior, but actually drops down just because it makes things easier to uh, converge if, uh, if this thing isn't heading up forever. Uh, we have a uniform prior on M, which I forgot to write down, up to 50,000, in fact, <laughs> uh, just because it makes no difference. How does that the, um, your prior, the turnover of your prior for M compared to the actual M? Oh, noise is equal to 1. So it's very, yeah. very far away, yeah. It's, it's really just to stop uh, numerical issues when. OK, so. Um, this is um, uh, some preliminary results. We, I'll explain some other results in a, in a moment, but this is sort of handy to get your eye in. So these are the injections. This is energy as in this some of the squares of the amplitudes. Uh, energy against frequency here. And this is on a logarithmic axis for energy. And these were randomly chosen, as you can see. These are the uh, reconstructions the, of, the, of the power spectrum. Uh, we actually. Uh, explicitly asked uh, the algorithm to construct the power spectrum, which is a specific entity which you're able to ask it to do, and and here it is. And just for comparison, this is this is a periodogram of the same thing. Um, so 
I think right away we can see that the, um, the uh, for this Hessian, or at least the lack of confusion uh, to some extent in, in the, the Bayesian reconstruction is, uh, is quite significant over a conventional periodogram. If we uh, zoom in on, on the spectrum, you can see how this works. What's actually happening here is that this is slightly being misrepresented because it's on a, a logarithmic scale. The majority of the structure are just all the side lobes of the, of the, um, of, of the transforms of each of the components overlapping and, and uh, confusing each other. Whereas here, for the, for, for the Bayesian spectrum, um, uh, the d distinctness between the individual components is much more clear. And these are being colored alternately red and green because the algorithm can work out what's, which sample is which. And look here, we have at the end of this animation, there's a pair of frequency samples which are actually on top of each other, uh, but the algorithm is able to distinguish between them. And it's able to distinguish between them from the combination of the, um, essentially from the phase. It's, it's able to, um, in a power spectrum like this, you throw away the phase, of course. Um, uh, but if you think about this in terms of, the, of an A, F, and P, uh, uh, 3D space, then it's quite easy to distinguish between the individual components. What is green and red? They're, they're just um, every other component, which oh, it's, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, um, so in order to work out which component is which, there's a rather an important step which hasn't got anything to do with MCMC at all. Um, and that is we've set the problem up in such a way that it's invariant under switching of labels. We don't know which, lab which, which of the sources is which. So we need some way to say what is source one, what's source number two. And the obvious way to do it is uh, to order them in frequency. So source one has the smallest frequency up to, up to the last source. And so um, uh, we have a procedure which is... Uh, essentially a clustering technique in, in, um, in the parameter space. So you order all the MCMC samples in frequency. Um, you choose M to be the most probable M. I haven't said anything about the probability distribution for M yet, but M is a parameter. It has a distribution. Uh, there's a most probable M, and we choose that one. Order the, um, and, and for that particular M, there may be N MCMC steps which um, occurred. That means that there are the n times n um, parameter, uh, p p parameter triples. And we order those in frequency. And then we perform a, a cluster analysis on those, which I won't head into right now. Um, uh, but essentially, it lets you uh, allocate the MCMC samples to a particular, to a particular, a particular source. And um, sometimes it's relatively easy. So here we have some strong, close signals. Uh, and this is the joint posterior, if you like, between um, the A's and the B's and the F's. So if you remember, the A was the amplitude for the cosine of the, of the, of, of, of the signal, and that's the uh, amplitude for the sine, and F is the frequency. And these are essentially regions where the, where the uh, samples are. Um, so, so in other words, the, 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 what we have here are raw MCMC uh, samples. <laughs> clustering around. And it's very easy to split them up. So here we have, for example, uh, the A's from that signal and the A's from that, that signal obviously are, are, are independent and separate. Here we have, um, uh, again, this time the A's against the B's, this time the um, F against the B. Um, in terms of frequency, this uh, red line here is 1 over T. So as you can see, these are a pair of samples which are significantly closer together than the classical uh, resolution criteria for, a, for um, a power spectrum. But we very easily are able to separate them and identify them. That's because they're strong. And if you did 1 over T times SNR, SNR would be the it, would, it would be round about that width there, yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. And um, here's a little animation of much the same thing when you bring the signals together in frequency. So, so we've just seen an example where they're well separated. Let's now have a look what happens when uh, uh, confusion begins, because of course confusion happens eventually. And as you can see, all is well when they're separated well in frequency, but when they begin to come together, uh, particularly the energies here become very uncertain indeed. And that's, that's very clear what's happening here. You have a pair of signals very close together in frequency. They, they, they will add up over the run in such a way that they might be in antiphase. And if they're in antiphase, it's very hard to tell what their amplitudes are. Um, if you don't allow them to um, um, evolve to a maximum um, in the interference pattern. Um, 
so there will be situations where it's very, very hard to work out something like energy. But remarkably, you can still work out which source is which. You can still work out there are a pair of sources here, because it, it maintains this um, red, and, red and green uh, s separation between the sources, despite the fact when you project them onto any particular plane, uh, it looks like they're overlapping. But in 3D, they're, they're actually um, reasonably independent still. But, so, based on the clouds, the, the statistics of your clouds, you mm -hmm. will know when the answer is, I don't know. Yeah, okay. that's right, yeah. Now, what did you assume for the prior, for the, for the amplitudes? The amplitudes were a uniform prize. Um, that's, the, that's why it explodes up. Um, so there's nothing, nothing to favor. This isn't like an astrophysical population. No, no, there isn't anything like that at all. And so the reason why the energies here are able to get ludicrously high is because we were allowing the amplitudes to be. You get essentially thinks, well, maybe there are two large, large amplitude signals that are. Exactly in antiphase. Mostly, yeah, yeah. yeah. A and B yeah. could be anything. But they could be almost anything, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, that's right. How do you tell which is green and which is red? Uh, that's the basic criteria? No, that's the uh, cl cluster analysis within, uh, uh, with, within, the parameters, within the parameter space. So here, it looks like everything's overlapping. But actually, remember what we're displaying here are projections of a higher dimensional, higher dimensional parameter uh, space. Or is it simply lower? The color assignment is? The color assignment the, uh, is frequency. from the clustering analysis. So I haven't said much about the clustering analysis, but it's essentially a hierarchical uh, minimum variance argument where you, you essentially begin with every sample in its own cluster, and then you merge the clusters uh, together. So you, you, you merge the closest things to the next closest things, and you carry on until you end up with M uh, clusters in the end because you've decided that there are n that, signals. That's where the Occam's factor has to come in? Um, um, no, the Occam's factor actually heads in in the next slide, I think. Um, yes, wonderful. OK, so, so um, the Occam's factor is the one which restricts n. It's, it tells you that you, do, you only need a certain number of sources. And um, these are the posteriors for the number of sources. Um, so this is probability against M. Now, if you remember, we injected 100 sources here. Um, it's saying the most probable uh, number of sources is 95. Now, that's right in the sense that, remember, this is also um, in the, the situation of reasonable amount of noise. And therefore, some of the sources which were injected will have been very, very weak indeed, well below the noise level, and there's no way we could have ever recovered them. And, and there were about five. So what's, what, this is, what the Occam factor here has, here has said is that it cannot justify 100 sources in here. It can, what it thinks there are are 95 sources and slightly higher noise. It's allocated the sources it can't resolve to noise, because it is noise. That's what so noise means. A subset of the ones that are there? Yes. So the 95 it thinks are there are the strongest, essentially, the strongest 95. Actually, it's not the strongest. It depends on, on how they're positioned um, um, next to each other. What often happens is that the source next, a, strong, a weak source next to a strong source is, is actually hidden. That's, that's the most useful, that's the most often happening thing. And here we have the reconstruction for sigma, uh, which when, if you were to insist that m was 100, was 100 then your reconstruction for sigma would be around about right. Uh, uh, but for 95, it's slightly high, which is what you'd expect, because you need to conserve the power. OK, so that's the graph we've already seen. Uh, but just to highlight a particular area of it here, um, uh, these spectral plots are, are essentially just a posterior probability and frequency, uh, but scaled uh, by the most probable a squared plus the most probable, uh, most probable a squared. Um, um, so if we magnify up that little area there, you can see um, uh, what we actually have in terms of a joint probability of energy and, f energy and frequency. Each of these here is a contour, a 95% contour, around uh, what the algorithm believes to be uh, a source. And the blobs here are the actual answers, which um, were superimposed on top. That one it hasn't found. That one uh, was right next to this one. and it. Ne it, and it never found it. This is the width of uh, 1 over t. So here we have a pair of horses here whose energies are very uncertain because they're so close in frequency. Um, but here we have the periodogram for the same interval. And in fact, if you, if you were to slice this at the right height, then you'd end up with uh, 
uh, information which looked a bit like this. But the information here isn't held in the right isn't held in the right form. There's all this extra stuff in in side lobes. And uh, are, but are you presenting the periodogram in its most favorite approach? I mean, you could tune the side lobes, right? When do we find it? You could do that, but of course, then your your uh, frequency frequency resolution drops. This is with the highest frequency resolution it can do, which is just without any any windowing at all. Uh, what else do we have? Okay, so here we have a, again a pair of well separated signals. Um, we, we, we have these 95% uh, contours um, around the truth. Um, they're easily distinguished here again of the, of the joint probabilities. Here's the estimate. These, these curves here are the estimates of the uh, power uh, spectrum of, of the source. This, this, little, this smooth line here is actually the, um, the, uh, the periodogram for the same interval and this red line here is again 1 over t. So those are well se an example of well separated sources. Here we have what happens when the sources are rather close together. We can still separate them as individual sources but the uh, values of the parameters are not very well uh, constrained. So now we've got these 95% contours for the energy, for example, which are enormously higher than, 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 than the truth, which is here and here for the other source. So this is a result of the, um, um, the, the, in, the intermixing, the covariance of the parameter variables, which is inevitable, which you, you can't ever overcome. There comes a point when any algorithm will have to break. So the initial distribution of energies that you chose was some flat distribution? Um, well, we choose uniform distribution on the amplitudes of the components. So this is A squared plus, uh, plus, plus, uh, plus A squared. And it was uniform in A and A, A, A and A and A and B. Okay, but the, so. the, the prior that you assumed when on the um, on the A's and B's, when doing when calculating the, the when calculating these, uh, yeah, um, you had, you it, had no no limit. It's it's yeah. able to go as high as you like, um, and that's obviously wrong. You know that in in the real world you could in, you could you could improve on this, but I mean the fact remains if you have a pair of of signals which are <laughs> almost cancelling each other out in the presence of noise, then there's not much you can do, really. There's not much there. Um, and this is just expressing that in a quantitative way. It's just saying exactly how much there isn't there, how uncertain you are. Graham, um, this was applied to Lisa with you know, signals that you knew were there. But mm -hmm. a lot of this formalism seems to me you could apply to what we're currently using the Hub transform for. It's computationally expensive, and it really only works well when there's a signal to be found. Not for upper limit. Upper limit is very difficult because. Okay. Uh,